really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Um, to get things started, um, just tell us quickly about yourself and, and your background. Sure, Ted. Yeah, so I'm a Brit, as you can probably hear from the accent. Um, started my life actually as a musician, ended up as an accountant. Uh, since then, we've qualified and worked with two of the big four, been a partner in one of the top ten of firms as a corporate finance partner. Uh, these days, I work with growth stage tech businesses generally. And so my life is largely taken up with doing fundraisings, doing company sales, bits of acquisition and pre and post uh, deal support. So that's me. I guess when you're when you're working with tech companies, what are some of the common or with with new companies? What are some of the common mistakes or misconceptions they have about a diligence process? Firstly, they have this tendency to think it's going to be very lightweight. And so they underestimate the sheer amount of effort that's going to be involved in the process. Um, and associated with that is they can get really defensive about the questions that are being asked. Um, and I think it, in combination, those are the two key things that I spend a lot of my time trying to prepare companies for, is there's a lot of work in this and it's lots, lots of it is disruptive to the business. But also, it, it, there is a good reason why we're being asked the questions we're being asked. Yeah, um, I guess for all the advisors out there, do you have some techniques or or procedures or ways that you you prep clients? I think the best one is I have my favorite due diligence questionnaire ever, which was from a very, very big international firm. Um, it runs to 25 pages of questions, and I have a tendency to provide that and say, Look, this is a bit out of date, so there'll be extra ones to add these days. But just to give you an idea of what's coming, this is what it is. And I think the other bit is really just saying to people, as part of the preparation, think really hard about who is running the business and who's running the transaction, who's running the deal. Because I've seen way too many businesses seriously disrupted by transactions. And you, know, you get partway through if it's an acquisition, and if the business has been distracted by it, you end up with a price dropping because your performance drops. So having that preparation in place, working with them, thinking about what you're going to need, and to be honest, getting your data room up to speed as early as you can are the key things from my perspective. Um, lots of things to touch on there. I guess like when you think about companies that do this really well, are there any like are there any divisions of labor that you see that work well? So like the CEO is responsible for the deal, hands it off to somebody else? It, it really depends on the personalities that you've got in that team. But yeah, you're right. I mean, probably one of the best ones I've ever done, I as CFO was working hand in glove with the chairman. And he and I basically did the deal. We left the COO, the CEO and the chief commercial officer to get on with running the business day to day. And that worked really well from that perspective. And yeah, you have to drag people in for bits. You're gonna need bits of information along the way, but it did allow us to actually try and ring fence the business from the transaction. That's really smart. And you mentioned preparing for the deal and deal staging. How quickly do you get, get your clients into, into staging the deal? Again, that depends on how the deals come about in part. I mean, if, if you're doing a sale process, then I'd be doing it alongside preparing the information memorandum, sales memorandum. I do that really early. Um, you don't always get that chance. If you're doing a fundraise, similarly, start building the data room alongside doing things like updating the projections, updating the business plan, all of those sort of things, doing the preparation, collect what you need at the same time. It's a good double check. It's a great check for how prepared you are to go into pitch. At the same time, it gets you ready and takes some of the pressure off during due diligence. The exception to the rule, of course, is somebody approaches you when you're not ready for it, not expecting it. And those are the situations where, for me, doing that separation is really important. And that particular one that went really smoothly was exactly that. We had, we were in about month two of an 18 month plan to get ready for exit at the point at which we were approached by the eventual purchaser. And so that's one where we absolutely had to do it. And we then had to stop, put a bit of a team together, make sure we had the resources, 
to get on with it. And again, manage the situation with the funder, with the purchaser as part of that. That was part of what I was doing, was actually saying, look, you're going to have to give us some time to create this because we're not there. And the worst thing that you can do is go into it rushed, go into it too early or not manage those expectations. It comes back to bite you later in the transaction. And in I guess in terms of like opening up the data room, how like in an ideal situation, how early would you open it up or would you start staging on a data room? Yeah, no, that, that's that's a really good one. I mean, opening up internally, it depends. If possible, I love to do it internally first and get all of those things up and ready in place. Sometimes you don't quite have the time for that. So in those cases, I'll probably use, uh, as it were, an off deck uh, solution. So I might use you know, Dropbox to collect stuff make sure I've got it reviewed, sign it off with everybody internally, then upload it. But quite often what I'm finding these days is actually as part of the initial interaction, you're starting to populate a data room. And so it starts quite naturally and quite early. It's one of those things around making sure the data room you go with has that ability to allow you to sort of ring fence access. And that's mm -hmm. really important. It's where Dropbox fails because once you're into Dropbox, you're into Dropbox. You know, and there are a whole loads of reasons why Dropbox isn't the right answer, but it is that it's much more stages now about there's a first initial stage, put that first level of information in there that allows your counterparty, whether it's a funder, whether it's a potential purchaser, to see the core things you want them to see, and then have a second round that in involves getting that DD information up there. And to be fair, you're always going to need to... Uh, Date that DD information for extra bits of requests. All purchases have their own slightly quirky requests as to what's of interest to them. So I find it's those stages. The other bit that people often forget is the data room is actually vital post deal as well as pre deal. And so actually making sure you've got it and you've got it ready and that you can get it downloaded easily is one of the you know, key aspects from my perspective. What is the data room typically, or the information in the data room typically used for post deal? Like, why why is that important? Nine times out of ten, it will be a requirement of the agreement, whether that's an investment agreement or whether that's a sale and purchase agreement, for that information that has been disclosed, even if it's not being disclosed as it were formally through a disclosure process, to be available. Hmm. The other point is. You, you're in a situation where somebody's either investing and will become a significant investor in your business or is acquiring, they're going to need those records going forward. So those elements are important. The other bit that I find more and more often is actually in post-acquisition integration or in post-funding support giving, you reference back to that information that was there at that date. And it's it's not a question of, well, we told you about that. It's not that sort of approach. It's the, right, when we were going through DD, we looked at these bits. We know we need to either address this or this is really good. Can you tell us more about this? Because we'd like to do this within our organization. So it's those sort of things where it isn't dead data just because the deal's done. It's live data and it will actually live with you long after that transaction. Are there any scenarios where the, the acquirer will just keep the data room open and keep, keep it updated? Yeah, and it, it's a really interesting one. I'm beginning to see businesses using what you would traditionally have thought of as data room providers like Firmex almost as a corporate repository. So absolutely, they do that just because it's easier to keep control. It's the same reasons you have the data room in the first place. You've got control over who has access. You've got control over the docs that are in there. And it's just, you know, I, I've been working with a business, for example, that was acquired by a Californian company. So we have the joys of eight hour time difference. That data room is really important. It means their legal team, if ever a question comes up, they don't have to wait for the following morning. They can dip straight in, take a look. They know what that documentation is and they can get to it easily as well because the indexing and all of the search capabilities that are there are still available to them. You mentioned earlier you that, that you can't like, the downfalls of using Dropbox as part of a diligence process. 
Um, what do you do when a client comes to you and maybe they're cost sensitive or they're like, just like, especially if they've never done a deal before, they might not know what a data room is. How do you sort of walk them through and say like, this is this value in this? Two levels to that. One is you're right. You walk them through and you explain and you explain the challenges of trying to use Dropbox and keep control. I, the key thing to remember is a data room is going to contain the crown jewels of the company information. You want to have control over that. You want to know who has access to it, who's downloaded what. You want to be able to do things like watermarking those documents. I mean, those things are really important. Um, and also, in all honesty, I can give them real anecdotes of where trying to work through a Dropbox system simply doesn't work, not least because the users don't necessarily get updated properly on the updates. There's no Q&A capability. There are all of those extra added value things around the data room that you simply don't get. My next stage, in all honesty, is generally to get them to talk to Vermex in particular and just say, look, this is the actual cost because they look at it and they say, it's gonna be massively expensive. Well, no, actually it's really good value if you do it properly. And also make sure you talk to people and do it the right way. Companies will generally massively underestimate the amount of information that needs to go in there, the number of people who are gonna have access. So a model that works for that, as the Firmex model does, is great. There are other models out there that I don't like because they're seat models and it looks cheap, but in the end it isn't. And it's those sort of things I think that I tend to go through just to help people understand you need to be in control. And actually these guys do it day to day rather than us trying to cobble something together. And it, there's nothing wrong with Dropbox. Dropbox is brilliant. Similarly, you know, the, the Microsoft, the, the Google alternatives out there are fantastic for what they do, but they're not designed to cover off the sorts of things that you're gonna to need to have in a fundraiser or an M&A type situation. If you're a, um, a business owner who's looking at doing a fundraise or an M&A transaction for the first time, maybe they're, they're selling their business to retire, um, what resources, like what, what can they do to get prepared um, outside of obviously talking to a, a good advisor? Is there anything else they can do to kind of get their heads around? Like, I've been in and around a few transactions myself, and it's always, even for experienced people, it's shocking how much work and distracted you can get. It really comes back to that preparation point. It's start early. In fact, start earlier than that um, would be the best thing. You know where all your documentation is, and bear in mind, just because something happened five years ago doesn't mean it's not going to be of interest. Uh, and here in the UK, tax information we need to provide at least six seven years worth of information so you're going to have to have that people are going to want to crawl all over those bits so collect it make sure you've got it I and mean, i i'm with you i always think it's going to be way way more of everything way more detail way more time to manage go back to who's doing the deal who's running the business way more people wanting access than you expect uh, I, I did a transaction not that long back where there were 35 people on the other side, uh, of whom probably 15 were lawyers. <laughs> it, and that's on top of our side, our lawyers, our guys. There will have been 55, 60 people in that data room at its height to go through. And I think it, the other point is make sure that you thought through anything that while you're putting it up that you need to address take that time is the other benefit when you see something and you think oh hold on a minute that's not signed right let's sort that out and that's the point take the time to do it but it's pretty much if you start from the worst case of every document with a third party and every internal document you've ever shared with an employee you may need to use then it's up it's all good news from there on really <laughs> So you check every document. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, know, it, it, you would be amazed the little things that come out and the things where you discover that it, all of a sudden you discover you don't have a signed copy. There's a wonderful story from a few years back of two law firms merging and the entire process stopping for six weeks when one of them realised it didn't actually have a signed partnership agreement. Yeah. 
it's just those things because it it's the everyday bits that you're going to get tripped up on not in a bad way but just a sort of right we need to deal with this and they can string out the transaction so do it early do it earlier and check it in detail is there added risk so when that when things like that happen um and I, I've seen a few as well, like we'll, where small details have like will will be overlooked and it's like a pens down moment. Um, is there does that increase in your mind or you're like, is, is, does a transaction get riskier as the time goes on? So like if there's more delay, it's less likely the transaction will go through. I, I suppose so. I think I, I tend to try and say to every client, there will be a bump in the road in this process. Um, and yeah. Do I get more nervous the closer we get to completion? Yes, if it hasn't happened. Um, if it does happen, does that mean I relax? No, because it could still be something else. But it, it, it does to a certain extent. But I think, again, if you're prepared, if you know what you have and you know where there are holes or any skeletons, then you can address those early and that avoids that problem. So it, that's always what I'm looking out for when I'm working with companies is I want to understand what there is we should be sorting or alternatively what there is we should be disclosing early rather than hiding it because I hate to say it but people doing due diligence are going to find that hole if it's there so don't hope that they don't and if they don't for some obscure reason it's going to be covered by the warranties and the indemnities anyway so there's no point you're going to get caught at some point so Let's actually sit down and deal with it and deal with those bits. But some of this, again, is about there's a perception piece around this, Ted, that's really important. That perception of going in and looking at the business. And I've done due diligence as well as being DD'd. If you go in and they look organized, you get comfortable. If they look disorganized, you start questioning everything. It extends the process. It risks chipping on price. It risks... Um, or you know, just extending everything. Whereas if you've got it organized, you've got it in a nice place, you've got it in a proper data room so that people feel you're on top of it. It just makes the whole process run that much better. That makes a lot of sense. Um, it's, it's almost like basic human psychology. Um, it is. It, it's that classic statement, is it? Perception becomes reality. Yeah. And it's that point about if I go in and everything's under control up to a point, um, then I'm looking at it and going, actually, this lot probably know what they're doing. If I go in and it's a sort of, I've been told, oh, yeah, the data room's ready, but there are three items in it. It's a sort of, well done, what's going on here? And then stuff appears, and every time it appears, you're looking at it going, is this actually what I asked for? And it's just human nature, as you say. Whereas if it's there, you can look at it and you can go, okay, I might need to ask some extra, or can I just have a bit more over here? That's fine. Does that perception expand, extend to the speed at which the the seller will get back? So if someone asks for that little extra piece and they're able to respond in a, in a timely, clear fashion? It can do as long as the seller and their advisors are organized. Yeah. Um, that's the other joy of a proper data room. <clears throat> uh, I remember years ago doing a, doing a transaction and at one point the lawyers from the other side came back and said, well, we, we haven't really made much process, progress on this. And I said, well, the data room has been available for you for 10 days and you only signed in for the first time yesterday. So I'm not entirely surprised. <laughs> you know? And it's that sort of, yeah, whatever you do, you have to work with your counterparty to actually make sure their advisors are keeping up to speed. Just because you are, you can't assume they will be. Yeah. But yeah, generally, if it's well organized, if it's well set out, if it's easy and intuitive for them to find their way around, they're likely to find the bits they want to ask about earlier and so they can come back and you can keep the momentum rolling. You don't end up with that hideous sort of walking around the table period while you're waiting for the questions to land. <laughs> I think we touched a little bit about this, but there are there any other risks that can come up during, during the diligence process? So like as you're, as you're prepping a, a seller, um, what are some of the core risks you're trying to mitigate? They tend to be industry and company specific but they're generally those things around the paperwork's not complete um even on things like previous funding rounds it can be you know, are we sure we've got the right paperwork we've got the tax clearance if we need a tax clearance in there 
The other bits can be country specific over here in the UK. We have some very generous tax breaks around share option schemes, but there are strong rules about when those tax breaks can and can't apply. Those are things where you want to go back, and make sure you're comfortable, make sure that actually similarly, if you've claimed either grants or tax breaks for research and development or things of that sort, that that paperwork is in place and you're comfortable with what's in there. Those sort of things are, are important because they are things that will be picked up. And I guess because people like me are doing things regularly, we get to know both what are the core things people are looking at and what is the flavour of the moment in terms mm -hmm. of right now, everybody's looking at X as being you know a key thing because there's been a big case around it or because the tax authorities have issued a statement about how they want to treat it or whatever it is. Those things are the things I tend to focus in on because you just know what it's going to be. Otherwise, with a, with a purchaser or a funder, you generally learn during your initial conversations what are the bits that interest them. So then you can go back, and make sure you've got those bits really polished, really ready for them. That makes sense. And I think like the you've alluded to this several times, but the approach is if there's any like if there's any anything of concern, share it early and clearly um, and talk about it early in the process. Exactly. And, and preferably flag it with a this is what we're doing or this is our proposal to deal with it type approach. You know, for, for example, the classic ones of, yeah, the CEO, the founding CEO doesn't have a service contract. Now, we can put one in place if you want, but we know you're going to want to. So why don't we just, can you send us what you're going to think about? And we might as well put a version of that in place or at least have it ready so that we can do it at completion, sorted. It's that sort of thing where you've got a plan. The worst thing you can do is almost put a list of, you know, here are all the failings in this business on the table for people, but it's a sort of, look, you're going to find these bits, this is what we're doing about it, or alternatively, this isn't an issue because, so you can address them from that perspective. In terms of flavors of, I don't want to say this flavors of the moment, but things things that are trending, um, it's definitely not a flavor of the moment, but um, have you noticed um, ESG concerns coming into diligence at all? Yeah, and I think they've grown over the years. Um, it started out as being sort of peripheral. It's becoming more and more important. Again, tends to be quite industry specific. Um, and the questions that come out, therefore, can be industry specific as well. Sometimes it's just strange because you're looking at them and you're thinking, actually, that doesn't come anywhere near what we do. But that's fine. And that's one of those things when you get into due diligence, you'll always go through the list and you'll say there's 10 to 15 percent of these questions simply don't apply to us. Mm -hmm. So there are things around those ESG areas that are quite hard for early stage for growth companies because they've generally not got into that space, yeah. um, less for some reason they're core to their business. So there are anything as part of ESG that touch all companies that that even like smaller companies should be thinking about? I think it's showing that you've thought about them. Um, it tends these days to be the size of an acquirer is important in this because they will be looking for what they have and matching it. But clearly all the diversity pieces are really important in there. Um, the sustainability aspects, those vary. If you're a pure software company, they tend to be less important than if you're involved in manufacturing or actually running your kit in any great degree. So they do vary. But I think the diversity pieces and I'm seeing more and more information around employees and from the HR perspective around those areas coming up. To change gears a little bit, we've talked about we've talked about data room and getting the right tool for the job. Um, for people who've never used a data room or clients that have never used a data room before, what kind of like what would how would you advise them to evaluate a data room? What would you look what would you tell them to look for? It goes back to what we talked about earlier it's going to have the crown jewels in it. So you know, item number one before you've even got anywhere is go with somebody who does this for a living because they're going to have the security in place, but ask the questions around that. Do your infosec checks, you know, all of those things, which we've done with you guys. I've done with you guys multiple times <laughs> over the years. From there, I guess for me, there are four bits that are really important. I want it to be intuitive to use and find a way around. 
So have a demo. If you can, get the opportunity to have a play first. The important thing there being, I don't want it to take me lots of time to work out how to put things into it or how to set people up on it. Similarly, I don't want to be spending half my life answering questions from lawyers, accountants, you know, whoever who's doing the DD on the other side about how do I find this? So I want it to be intuitive. I want it to be really clear that we have control and that by which I mean on that one, that we can control the people accessing the data room and the documents in the first instance, and that we have control over where the documents are going. So things like watermarking of documents is really important for me if you're going to allow download. And that ability actually to say some things you can download, some things you can't, but actually have that flexibility built in there. Um, and have the recording around that as well. So you know who's downloaded what, who's had access, when they've had access. That example of the lawyers not going in was brilliant because I could go in on the back end, look at it and say, well, yeah, I know why you've not made any progress because you haven't started fundamentally. <laughs> um, the other bit for me is it wants to be really easy to get information in. So bulk uploads is an important part of that process. And equally, as we talked about earlier, it needs to be easy to get it out afterwards. And you know, that's not just an index, but it's the whole lot. It's that package of download that's important. And for me, the fourth aspect is just, if at all possible, I'd go for the Q&A built in. It just makes it easier to link things across than having to work outside with a great big spreadsheet and try and manage the questions from that perspective. And you avoid answering the questions several times when the accountant asks it and the lawyer asks it and the guy doing the commercial DD asks it and then the CFO on the other side asks it. So why don't we just have one set of questions? <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and this we've touched again, I'm, I'm kind of going all over the place, but we touched about this a little bit, but we've talked about both like um, diligence as part of an M&A transaction and diligence as part of like financing or fundraising. Um, how do those differ? It's a really interesting one because superficially they look as if they're going to be the same, but actually they're quite different. Um, and you're right. Anybody who's been through a fundraising thinks they know what's coming when they get to the M&A, when they get to that exit point. And then they sit back and look at my 25 page questionnaire and go, hold on a minute, I've only ever had a page and a half from the funder before, what's going on? I think for me, three key things to think about. The first one is the same across the two. And I guess it's the, the counterparty effectively saying, what are we getting ourselves into here? In other words, let's actually understand what's in there, what's in your business, what's in your companies. Um, and also, out of that, what needs to be covered in the agreement? And that fundamentally is the same across both. From there, it sort of slightly changes. If you think about it, a funder is sort of bought into a transaction already at the point at which you've got to do the DD because they've been through, they've been through their investment committee first round type processes. Actually, they're quite bought into wanting to do this. So for them, the other elements are actually quite positive bits. They're about which areas are going to need support, um, which areas are going to need real investment, just so we understand that. Are there bits we're going to need for our final investment paper around those? And actually, quite often, there's a bit that's just a risk assessment in terms of what's the funding that's really needed here. Um, I, did, I did a fundraise last year where the investors came in, they were quite happy with the amount that we were talking about. And they said, look, we actually think you can accelerate a bit more if we put more in. Let's come back and talk about how that might work. And what we actually did was that we swapped from doing a bit of secondary, in other words, some of the existing shareholders selling shares to that investor putting more directly into the company to allow us to accelerate the business. So that was a really positive, and all of those are a positive, collaborative, forward moving. m and is slightly strange because m and you've got your purchaser who's clearly keen on doing a transaction, but at the same time, they have advisors who are almost acting as a gatekeeper, as a, you, a counterweight to the client's enthusiasm. And what they're looking at is, instead of support areas, they're thinking about what's the integration plan? What are we going to need to do here? What are we going to have to change to get this to fit together? Where are things like, where are the cultures? Where's the information piece? You know, it may be if you're going to be acquired by a you know, NASDAQ listed business, can these guys meet the timetables? 
for doing quarterly reporting. Do we have the level of detail that's needed? All of those things are important. And I hate to put it this way, but part of an M&A due diligence is about, is the pricing right? Or more to the point, what can I do to try and chip away at the price a bit? So unless you go in very clearly up front, you've got a really strong position that says there will be no chipping, and both sides are agreed on that, you're going to find particularly the finance guys are looking through going, hold on a minute, that's bigger than we expected it to be. There's a bit over here that might cause us an issue and all of those things. You don't really get that as much on the funding side. You will get a bit around what's the pricing look like? Can we support it? But it tends to be more supportive. And in the m and it can feel a bit more confrontational from that perspective. And it's particularly because you've got that extra set of people who don't really have an interest in the future, but are there to try and protect their client. Mm. At the same time as you've got the client looking to do a transaction, and you've probably got a CFO also going, how do I show my shell as I get best value? So there are subtleties of difference. The other point is m and can be really quick. Funding can be, but funding can be a slightly longer process. m and can be, depending on what people want to do. But m and it can get really very compressed to try and get it done for a timetable. So funding takes longer than m and typically. In general, that's my experience, because you're going through rounds. And unless you are in a fire sale investment type situation, you know, with a very short cash runway, you as the, the company being invested in don't, you know, yeah, you want to get it over with, but you don't want to push too quickly because it will make the other side come back and say, well, if you need it quicker, that means we change the pricing. So you move that piece. With the M&A, both sides want to get it done because they want to get on with life. So I'm actually finding that M&A seems to be being more compressed than I said it was, think it would have been two or three years back. But again, depends on the purchaser. Listed public company purchasers probably take that a bit longer because they're thinking about what am I going to have to do in terms of my disclosures now? And can you meet my disclosure requirements going forward? If you're being bought by a bigger private company backed by private equity, they may be saying, right, this is strategic. Let's get it done. We can do some tidying up afterwards. My DD is about understanding what I'm going to have to tidy up. And actually, I can see the value. That's fine. I'll go for the value and I'll worry about it later. In transparency, you've been a Firmex client since 2009, 2010, somewhere in there? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a repeat offender on that, Scott. I have used others um, because clients have chosen to go with other people on the way. But yeah, absolutely. I, I am a, uh, as you probably picked up, I'm a firm believer in what Firmex has to offer. <laughs> well, we appreciate that. Um, over your time, um, I guess, with Firmex, um, there's been a lot of changes in the due diligence process. Are there anything that comes to mind and how deals are done now? Maybe even in the last three years, like I, I know COVID has been a massive disruptor. Have you noticed any changes in, in how diligence is conducted? Yeah, absolutely. Um, over those 10 years, it's now way more remote. In fact, you rarely, if ever, get to meet with the people doing the DD other than on exactly the sort of conversation we're having now across the screen. Um, so I guess there's there's that piece. The fact that actually more and more the data room has become the centre of a transaction. And it used to be, here's the repository of the data, the detail, but actually there's a whole load of conversation and other bits going on outside it. Now everything is channeled through that data room for it to happen. And those, I guess, are sort of are the big pieces. I guess the other point is the scale of data rooms has just got bigger because, as you say, you've got the ESG type questions coming out. There's been clearly a whole new section around COVID over the last couple of years in terms of how, what's the impact been um, and, and even you know, what have you done in terms of government programs around COVID and things of that sort. So there are new areas from that perspective. Um, and I guess just generally more emphasis on compliance is another area, even in fairly you know, non-regulated businesses, non-public non-regulated businesses. There seems to be more focus on those compliance aspects than maybe there was three, five years ago. Do you have a sense of why that is? I think it's all to do with the way that people are looking at risk and actually the fact that over that period, governments generally have been trying to make sure that they're clamping down more. Um, you, you, there are governments around the world where you could say you know, they've been taking the, uh, 
the cushions off the sofa to see what's down the back. So there's more emphasis from that point of view. Uh, there's more activity from tax authorities in terms of doing investigations. There's more press coverage of things. There are more people out there finding bits of information about companies and therefore other companies become more concerned about it. Whether that's around things like how does your supply chain work? Are you comfortable that your supply chain is working ethically? Because there's that danger that the Wall Street Journal may run an expose on you if you're a big company at some point. So every acquisition you do now matters from that perspective. So I think there's a lot around those areas that's driving that behavior. And a lot of it is simply because more stuff is available digitally, there's more scrutiny. And if you look again, where I am in the UK, we now do our sales tax reporting digitally. Every company has to do it digitally. And it has to be linked directly into an accounting system. You can't do it on a spreadsheet and submit it. That means there's more information available to governments. That piece, I think, is driving the compliance, which is driving the risk, which is driving the DD. It seems like there's a connection between ESG and compliance. I think the two overlap. Um, for me, compliance is broader, way broader than that. But there is an interesting point that ESG has brought a real focus onto corporate ethics in its broadest sense, of which ESG is one bit. But there's a whole load of other pieces as well around you know, how close to the line do you walk, walk on certain things? You know, if if you're banging up against a regulated activity, you know, something that's actually, for example, regulated by financial services regulation, do you walk right up to the line and put your feet against the threshold? Or do you stay a that little bit further back? And it's those sort of pieces where I think there's more focus than there used to be around uh, are we behaving with integrity? Are we behaving with ethics that actually match what we're talking to our customers and the public about? Is there anything else you'd like to add about your business, um, about Firmex? I think from my point of view, you know, uh, what, I, what I do is work with companies. Um, and fundamentally, I describe myself as a special project maestro, because that's what I spend my life doing, working on special projects. Um, I think you know, over the years, I've built up a really good relationship with Firmex. I know I can rely on the product. I know that there's an ongoing development plan there, which brings new things in. You're responsive to inputs. So for me, it's great. And it's just, it's good to know I can introduce clients and I know they'll be well looked after because that's important for me. If I recommend somebody, it's my reputation on the line for recommending. So that's why I come back time and again. Oh, we appreciate that. That's very kind. <laughs> and we hope to, to co continue working with you uh, long into the future. Absolutely. Well, we, we've got at least one transaction coming up very shortly. Amazing. Oh, that's great. Um, I guess we'll end it there. Um, thank you for uh, taking the time to speak with us today. Not so sad. I've enjoyed it. Great. Yeah, it's been fun.